Hey everybody, thanks for coming out. I'm, uh, I'm Joe Robinson, I'm the organizer of Designers and Geeks. I'm one of four people wearing a really ugly sweater tonight, so everybody else, yes? Got two over here and there's uh, another guy somewhere. Uh, anyone? Ugly sweater? No? Maybe he's over at the beer, so. Um, anyway, uh, thanks for coming out. Um, glad everybody could make it so close to the holidays. Really appreciate you coming out. I think we're going to have a great time. Uh, at the very least, the ratio on the uh, raffle tickets is very good. A lot of people are going to be going home with something. So um, that should be fun. Um, and had a few special things tonight. Uh, the cookies, the pizza, the beer tasting. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm a huge beer geek. Um, we have nine different types of uh, Christmas ale. If you haven't already been over there, uh, my friend Eric's there pouring it. So um, please head over there after the talk and, and grab some. Um, so uh, very excited for the talk tonight. We have uh, Jeff Till. Um, he's going to be talking about um, sort of designing a sustainable urban future. Uh, some of his work in, in China doing that. It's a great talk. I've actually seen him present at other places before. So excited to, to have him here tonight. Um, before we get there, uh, I want to just say a quick thank you to Yelp. Um, they make this all possible, host us, provide the food and stuff. So uh, this is Eric from Yelp. Let's give him a quick round of applause. Thank you. Sorry, I don't have a sweater. Um, thanks for coming, guys. I'll be real fast. So uh, Yelp is, uh, is hiring product managers and designers. So if you guys are interested in either one of those things, you can drop me an email. I'm just Eric, Eric with a C at Yelp. Um, yeah, drop me a line. We'd love to talk. Have a great time. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Cool. Um, have a lot of great sponsors tonight. I'm gonna. Uh, we have dedicated sections for some of the prizes. So um, for the other folks in the audience, for O Power, for General Assembly, Dice, uh, some of the other places, um, we'll uh, we'll get to that after the talk. So um, without further ado, let's bring uh, Jeff Till up for his talk. Hi, I'm Jeff Till. Um, thanks for being here. Um, it's almost Christmas. So um, I actually don't have a really ugly Christmas sweater, so I apologize. I just cleaned my closet out the other day. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to just move on, and I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Um, I'm an architect. I work here in San Francisco for Woods Bagot. We're a global design firm. Uh, 15 studios spread around the globe. We're about 800 people. Uh, we do all kinds of work around the planet. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, sustainability and somewhat through the eyes of, of, of me and my experience in moving back and forth between Bay Area and all of that represents and China, which is something I do almost once a month. So hopefully this will be entertaining and uh, we can I'll perhaps exchange some ideas. So motion and directions, ideas on a, a sustainable urban future. I'm going to keep this pretty loose and um, I'm actually happy to, to stop and answer a question in the middle or we can do those at the end. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, you know, it's kind of hard to miss China sort of in the middle of everything we do these days. Um, in terms of motion and direction, uh, everybody, everybody needs a ride, right? So this is my ride. I do this about, about once a month. Um, and what I want to talk about a little bit is not so much the fact that we're going places, but where are we going and what's the destination and how does that relate to how we think our, about our futures in, in the built environment, particularly in the urban built environment. Um, and, and when you get off the plane on the other end, this is kind of what you find. Um, everybody's moving around and, and uh, everybody seems to be in a hurry to get somewhere. Um, and they're creating all kinds of new systems and new cultural patterns. Uh, in China based on their ability to move. So think about that for a minute. There, there's a whole generation of people there who are moving around in patterns, both for work and for play and for family, that their parents didn't do. And they have now the infrastructure that's growing rapidly to, in order to, to make that type of movement happen. Um, I think that's a pretty interesting thought. It's particularly interesting when you, when you contrast it with um, where we are. And, you know, we used to dream, and those dreams were very public. Uh, if you go back um, to our parents' generation or, or our grandparents' generation, um, we spent a lot of time talking about our future together and how great it was going to be and how new technologies would enable a new lifestyle. This, this type of thinking 
is the type of thinking that permeates now in China. It's the thinking we had in the 50s and the 60s. So when we go over there to talk about design and technology and how design and technology inform our aspirations about the future, this is the attitude that we're confronted with. So it's a little bit different. When you, come, when you get off the plane on the other end and you kind of get some sleep and, and, and wind yourself up for talking to people, this is kind of the attitude that you're, that you're experiencing. So I find that extremely interesting and very invigorating. On, as a contrast to that, when you come home to here, everything kind of goes <laughs> and you're back where things move very, very slowly. And the future is a troubling thing. Um, so this is how people are getting around now. There's a whole generation of people, particularly those in the sort of 25 to 35-year-old range who, who have, are growing up with this as how they, not just how they get to distant places, but it's shrinking their world, their movement radius from their city. This is Shanghai's train station. Is not, it's not 50 miles like, or 40 miles you might find with BART, but it's 200 miles and the time frame is the same. So and the other thing I think is really interesting about the way people are moving around and the motion right now of urban China is that it's not fancy. It's fast, but it's not fancy. So these are the, this is a technology that was, the, these trains are a technology purchased from, from Germany originally. But you'll notice it doesn't look like the inside of the ICE train coming out of Berlin. It's a lot more utilitarian. And the frequency is higher and the density is higher. It's moving a, a massive amount of people very quickly. Here's the network. How long have we been um, talking about getting from LA to San Francisco now <laughs> with high-speed rail? See all these colored lines? None of them existed five years ago. So you know, think about that next time you pick up the newspaper and someone's whining about how, how high-speed rail doesn't really serve us here in California. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, that, so people are moving around very quickly. The, the cultural response to that from a design standpoint is really interesting. Imagine if you grew up thinking, I can go 200 miles away, have a meeting, and be home in time for dinner, and never leave the ground. And not just to one place, but to many, many places. Um, so why do we need to go so fast? Are we obsessed with, you know, with speed? And, and, and what kind of decentralization of our urban spaces is that going to create in the end? That, that's really a, a riddle for current you know, urban development in China. This is the Wuhan train station, brand new, as, as they all are. Gives you an idea of the scale. And when you look at the departures board in these places and read the list of cities you can get on a train to, it's pretty interesting. But you know, more important, where, where are people going? So you, know, you can show up in a place like this, and there's this sort of iconic, these are the buildings in Pudong in, in Shanghai. Um, you can show up at these iconic places. The scale is completely uh, different. It's, it's not a human scale. It's a scale one, two, or three orders of magnitude bigger than the human scale which I find quite interesting. I, I, I try not to place a value judgment on it. It is what it is. It's certainly exciting and it's certainly iconic. But you know, below that scale, there's a whole other level of activity happening. And I think that um, for the average person living on the street in a place like Shanghai, particularly the older folks who've lived there all along, um, this is pretty interesting because it all sorts of, sort of melds together for them. Um, and I, this, this is sort of the shades of gray. This happens to be the view from our Woods Baggett Studio in Shanghai. Um, <clears throat> so underneath all of that glitz and all of that high-rise development and all that uh, uh, sort of futuristic uh, environment, um, the, the, the sort of human activity of trading, food, shelter, um, all of that's still happening. It's just, and it's, it's not on the radar screen. But those people are moving just as quickly as the people on the high-speed rail. And they have a completely different um, environment in which to do those activities. And that you may have heard about how folks are you know, getting relocated out of the places they've been living in for generations and finding themselves sort of on the, the rubble pile of, of old China, making a living in the new China. So this is sort of one of the byproducts of that intersection of, um, of technology and, uh, and, and design that's happening right now. So where are all these people going? Uh, we as designers, how many people here are, count themselves as designers? Just as a quick, that's a lot. At least half of you. Um, so you know, this, is, this is sort of what happens when someone says, hey, Jeff, can you come and look at my new site? Check it out. Uh, you show up, and, and it looks a bit like this. 
This is our new idea of um, urban uh, placemaking in, in our current context. And um, so the question then is, if there's all this motion, where's the direction? And if the direction is to a place like this, why? How do, how do we make something out of that? Um, you know, we, they, they, it's like we have to have six lanes in every direction, you know, so we can get all the cars moving very quickly. So imagine the people who have been living in relatively human-scaled context arriving at a place like this and probably not really knowing um, how they're um, meant to cross the street. So this is sort of a slide about you know, what happens when all that motion and direction ends. And, and what is the destination? Here's the destination. Here's the place that, that, that we're asking the people to live. This is uh, Ordos in, in, in uh, Inner Mongolia, which is, which is inside of China. Um, but this is nothing special. This is, this is being repeated thousands and thousands of times. So this is the, the destination. So we're going very rapidly on the latest technology to here. So I mentioned scale earlier, um, and I think it's really important for us, particularly in San Francisco, where we have a really wonderful scale, to think about the, um, the contrast between something like Pudong, where a block can be 485 meters, Kunming, this is a new portion of Kunming, a relatively new one uh, that's been designed here in the Bay Area, um, that's 120 meters for a city block, and then 70 meters, Portland, Oregon. If you probably hear a lot about Portland, Oregon if you're into urban design at all, uh, and how livable and human scale it is. So just Think about what it takes for someone to walk a block, uh, given those numbers there. So the scale of those urban places is, is uh, quite important in how we think about uh, people moving through space and, and scale. Um, this is a project that I'm working on. This is in Dalian, China, in the northeast, on the coast. We're doing a brownfield redevelopment of a waterfront there, old, old shipping piers that, that jut out into Dalian's harbor, and turning that into what we call an eco-district. So this is a notion of taking that 485 meters and pushing it pretty hard in the direction of Portland, Oregon, in terms of its scale. And thinking about ecologically intelligent infrastructure that can support highly sustainable buildings, using the very latest technology to wire those buildings together, both electrically and in terms of um, essential services like gray water, black water, um, and, and information. So this is uh, something that we're very proud of, and we, we, we hope to get this project underway in 2013. Uh, it involves uh, basically a whole new neighborhood for a city that reconnects the waterfront of the city back to its downtown or central business district. So it's, it's quite an uh, aspirational project in that regard. This is just to sort of contrast against some of the earlier images that you saw. Um, let's see if I can get the... Make a video here if I can get it to run. Nope, that's all right. Um, so just to give you an idea of um, what a radius of occupancy, if you will, might look like, um, in the time I've been speaking to you, which is roughly six and a half minutes, if you were on that train, you would have gone about 25 miles. So that represents the entire commute distance of the Bay Area and then some. So people are now building that into their thinking about who they are, <coughs> where they work, and where they live. And that's not just a few people, it's an entire generation of people in the largest country on the planet. So just think about that in terms of how we provide um, our own expertise and services to that population. 40 billion square meters um, in the next roughly, what is that, about um, 13 years now? Um, that's probably going, that number will probably go up because of the, G, the GDP is recovering quite well right now. Just to give you an idea what, what, what's going on in that part of the world. <clears throat> so when people talk about, hey, Jeff, I heard you were traveling back and forth to China all the time. What's it like over there? This is the image I like to, if I only had one image to show people, it would be this one right here. Um, everything we hear, everything I hear, I'm constantly playing catch up with my own perception of where, what, what, what the level of, of physical motion and cultural motion are and the direction of that as a country and as a culture um, and what it means to us. And just to bring it right back to here, I'll give you a quick anecdote of something that happened to me today, this morning on my bus ride into work. 
Um, as you may have heard, China Development Bank has committed uh, a loan of $1.7 billion for redevelopment at Treasure Island and Hunters Point here in San Francisco. That happened about 10 days ago. So the stipulation in that contract was that the general contract would be administered by a Chinese contracting company right here. That contracting company is none other than the Chinese rail construction company, the one that builds all the high-speed rail in China. They're here. So this morning I was talking about this very subject to a friend of mine on the bus, on, on the AC Transit bus, and a Chinese guy came up to me uh, afterwards and said, hey, I couldn't help but overhearing your conversation. I, I'm from the Chinese Railway Construction Company. <laughs> We're here. Handed me his card. We started a conversation. It turns out that, that the, the, the funder of this is also the funder of one of our projects in China as well, so we had some common thing to talk about. Um, so that's here right now in San Francisco amongst us. Not only do we have the 1.7 billion US dollars of, of injection of cash into our community, but it's coming with intelligence and recent experience, particularly around infrastructure. What we hope is that that infrastructure will be ecologically intelligent infrastructure that enables us to cost effectively build the most sustainable buildings we can in those two key locations, which are quite large. <clears throat> So I want to talk a little bit about process, just because the process that the construction industry now uses to deliver these places to you is in terms of homes and workplaces and places you might go uh, in, around in the city around you is, is pretty upside down. I mean, if you have to compare us to uh, the, the car industry or the aerospace industry, we're, we're not very advanced. We're kind of the knuckle draggers of making things. But we are trying to improve ourselves. And to do that, we have to actually change our process. So often if you're stuck in traffic, at least for me, I look around me and I realize uh, everything I see from the plastic cover on someone's tail light to the retaining wall that, that holds up the side of the freeway is designed by us. We designed everything we can see with the exception of the trees off to the side. So that's just a really hopeful message to say it's all about design. So if you're a designer, you have the power. Everything we see that we like or dislike or is functional or not functional around this urban environment was designed by us deliberately. So it's important to remember that. Um, our process you know, sort of started off with this heroic singular effort of someone you know, taking on um, the brilliant idea. And uh, I think the key thing here is not so much the um, antiquity of the tools and the, the methodology of the work here, but the fact that there's only one person in the picture. This is not a multidisciplinary situation we're looking at. And I think that's probably, if you, if you remember one thing about where does the design industry need to go, it needs to move from here forward. Um, so we've been doing some, um, some R&D at Woods Bagot to develop a better process capable of delivering zero emissions projects for global sustainability. And we're doing that not by ourselves, but we've partnered with engineers around the world uh, in order to be able to take things like environmental data. This is, this is a um, temperature data for a project, a pilot project we're doing in, um, in Chongqing in China, and be able to make that the feedstock for a database that allows us to design buildings which are inherently more efficient and more cost-effectively sustainable, particularly around energy. So uh, all we're trying to do then is gather up just thousands and thousands of, of, of database um, inputs and allow those to become a live and uh, real-time model for our own design ideas. Um, so in our way of e evolving our process is to, is to rechart or refabricate um, our own process as designers in a, in a multidisciplinary and collaborative way. So with, with engineers, me mechanical, structural, other specialty engineers, so that we're able to make design decisions in a much more informed way and turn around to the folks who pay us, our clients, and say, we can tell you right now, if this is your sustainability goal or your productivity goal for your employees, we can prove to you right now, empirically, that this is the most effective and, and expeditious way to get to that goal through modeling. So the inputs are things like uh, wind speed, climate, humidity, uh, <clears throat> throughput of humans on a mass transit system. All of those things are modelable in a parametric system. So, why would we design buildings the old way if we could use that type of input to deliver a much higher quality product to our clients and to our communities? 
this is a site in Chongqing on the side of the Yangtze River. It's 11 hectares of old steel mill. So all that stuff that looks rusty is rust. Um, <laughs> we have charted, uh, in an in a investigative process, we've charted all of the uh, legacy flows of things like water on that site and then been able to layer on 450,000 square meters of mixed-use development, um, including residential in three or four different sizes, uh, a high-rise building including office and, and hotel, uh, a retail center, schools, community centers, mass transit, um, all of that calculated to use um, a net zero energy and water on an annual basis. So this is a zero emissions conceptual idea that, which is completely engineered at that level. Um, so at the building level, that means understanding all of the latest technologies that go into um, making buildings high performance. For example, buildings that shade themselves when the sun becomes too strong, buildings that let more light in to reduce uh, artificial lighting electrical loads when they need to without human intervention. Uh, natural systems inside of buildings to um, cleanse both air and water passively without sending it all the way down into a city sewer or other infrastructural system, but doing that all locally, even within a high-rise building. So we call that ec an ecologically intelligent building, and it begins, of course, with the facade. The skin is up, the most important component in that. Uh, and the output of that, or the, the overall end product, is a place that's designed at a human scale um, to be experienced as a pedestrian. It's a place designed for people, not for cars, and is net zero on an annual basis. <coughs> So I like to say, you know, how do you do that? How do you, what's the infrastructure necessary? Uh, this image is just to get you to think about, um, if, you, if you think of the motherboard of a computer and you think about how it's designed specifically to receive that really high performance chip that sits in the middle and drives your machine, our, our infrastructure for buildings, particularly in new communities, is no less than the motherboard. And the chip is the building that sits within it. So if we're trying to do a lead platinum building and we only have X number of dollars per square foot to spend, we would be pretty ill-advised to try to plant that building into infrastructure that's not designed specifically to receive that building. And yet we do that all the time. There's a massive amount of value that's, not, that's being taken completely off the table in that process. So as architects and engineers, we're rethinking that process in order to build in the performance of the building knowing it's plugging into a much more intelligent system on the ground in horizontal development. So let's imagine for a moment then uh, how we would get to that point. Well, our process is, as, as architects, we've used these very powerful tools that are available out there today. Um, but there's an issue with those, and that is that we tend to take a deep dive in very detailed tools to see a range of solutions. And we have to pick amongst those. In this case, there's three. What we really need is to have a lot less accuracy. We need to know a lot less about how our building is going to perform at the very early stages of design. But we need to be able to iterate that across many, many iterations. Only then can we begin to find the solutions that are most optimal at a stage where the information is not so precious. So that we can turn around to our clients in the first couple of weeks of a design process and say, you know what? We tried 100 things. Here are the things that are starting to happen. Another way of looking at it would be if you just arrived in San Francisco and, and you, someone said, you know, I, I need you to meet me at the, tra the Transamerica Pyramid, but you weren't from here and you didn't know which way to go. All you're really looking for is a bit of direction. Um, so rather than getting three distinct answers that tell you in high degree of resolution or detail, here are three possibilities to get you to the Transamerica Pyramid. What we're looking at is a wide range of bad information, a low resolution, but enough. And by getting that low resolution in the very early stages, we're able to tell our clients, hey, you know what? We think it's generally right about there. And that's a very early and non-precious decision. And then we can take the much more powerful tools and apply that high resolution intelligence to it from a design standpoint. So right now, just getting back to the notion of an evolved process for, for building design, what we're really doing is, is using very powerful tools to iterate a small number of possibilities. So what we're advocating at Woods Bagot is something that's much more uh, wider, more of a shotgun approach, if you will. And the only way to do that for us has been to create our own tools. So it's direction and speed. 
all of the things that use energy or water in a building then can be modeled and, and in great detail and related to each other parametrically. Those parametric relationships then are put into an energy calculator and we've created a, a, a piece of software that, which then allows us to evaluate those in real time. So we're no longer saying, here's our design, Mr. Engineer. Please go look at that for two weeks and come back and tell us how it does. We think that process is over. What we need to do is up, output energy predictions in real time. So speed is incredibly important in this because you need to be able to try something and then throw it away. So what lets it go faster? Um, we simplify the geometry of the iterative designs. We found that uh, you know, basically a curved facade performs the same as a straight facade at this level of detail. Don't spend the time trying to understand the, the, uh, the uh, detail of how the sun hits a curved facade. Just model it straight. Uh, we've, so we've simplified the geometry. Um, we've simplified the zoning into passive and non-passive zones within a building. So we can look at a building like this and say, well, daylight's going to penetrate a certain number of meters into the room. We'll assign certain levels to that, and we'll assign a different, more a higher level of energy consumption to the rest. We've also simplified the weather data. So the model is crunching, rather than hundreds of thousands of weather, weather data points, we're, we're down to about 22,000 on a typical site. Uh, that allows us to get a much higher level of detail. How fast does it go? Uh, it's basically real time. So we're able to take a basic model, hot wire it up to the 3D software, and then model the 3D software in different locations, massings, length, width, number of stories, number of the distance between stories, and see um, right at, at, at that instant the number of kilograms of carbon, for example, uh, per square meter per year basic energy metrics, they can be manipulated uh, one way or the other to, um, for carbon energy or uh, uh, tailored to the local electrical rates. So what that allows us to do for any given parameter, let's say for example a parameter is uh, how much glass do you want in a building. We can then move that glass number up and down and, and for a particular building in a particular place on a particular site on the planet and understand what different glass ratios on a given facade will give us the highest performance output. So all of this is driving really just to kind of reel it all back in to sustainable development, um, to a natural response to sites. And that's what we're looking for. So we're, all we're trying to do with all of this technology is be more like a plant or a tree or a flower. So we've been doing this for uh, a couple of years. Um, in the natural world, there's been 3.4 billion years of um, evolution. So we've got a little ways to go. Um, thank goodness for computers. <laughs> I'm starting to go a little faster now. <laughs> um, so, uh, do, you, do you know how to get an animation to, to run that on this, on a PowerPoint? No. Um, so let's skip a little bit. There we go. So this is just an example of the building in the zero emissions pilot project I showed you earlier in Chongqing. Um, it shows how a building actually adapts its shape based on weather data and climate data and use patterns and occupancy. So a little bit difficult for us as architects to hear this, but we actually are stepping aside a little bit and saying, what, if we're going to design this high-rise building, what would happen if we stepped aside and allowed all of the parameters that are programmed to produce a high-performance building, the most sustainable and cost-effective building possible? And let's have a look at that before we have an idea about this aesthetically, just for a moment. That's what this is. So taking that to the next level then, we can start to break the building down into components and allow a scripted parametric program to assign high performance components to the outside of the building based on its solar income and position, solar orientation and, and geometric, or sorry, geographical location. So this is an example of that. And in the end, you know, can that building be an attractive building? We think so. Uh, this is a, a medical research facility we're doing in Australia. It's under construction right now. And the entire exterior skin of the building was designed parametrically, um, linking our 3D software through to um, uh, energy and environmental uh, inputs. So what does that mean for us to work in buildings and, 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 and live in buildings? 
Uh, it means that we have workplaces that are more humanly oriented, higher air quality, um, more natural light, more access to nature both visually and physically in terms of proximity. And it allows us to design buildings that are more responsive to the way people work now, today. We don't work the same way people did 10 years ago. We don't even work the same as people worked five years ago. We're teaming and working in unassigned workplaces in an increasing amount. Uh, we recently did a project, um, a big project down in Sydney where 95% of people, and this is for a bank, folks, not for uh, an internet company, a bank, not, not the most forward-looking folks in the world necessarily, 95% unassigned workplaces. What does that mean to the architecture, the sustainability, and the productivity of each one of those highly valued people? So um, that's just give you an idea, it gives you an idea of like what a new workplaces look like. These are a few examples from, from, from Woods Bagot. And I'll just sort of wrap it up by talking about Dalian one more time. Um, think about what it would take uh, in all of that fast motion, high speed rail, flying around the world. What does it mean when you actually get to a place that's worth being in? And how can we create places that are both cost effective and highly sustainable? And I hope what you'll get out of this is that one, technology can really help us do this, particularly through advanced parametric modeling, which is something that Woods Bagot is very much interested in and putting a lot of resources into research and development on. But I think more importantly, um, it's a way of thinking about our process, that how we as designers can put things like uh, cost-effective, sustainable responses right to the very top of our, pro our priorities and turn around and create that value for for people who are, are buying our services and living in the cities that we are imagining now. My goal then is to help us and, and the people we work with um, act more like the other creatures here on our planet. Um, that's really what the bottom line is because we're the only ones disrupting things at the moment and we, I, I think we're quite capable and smart enough to, to, to do a little bit less of that. Uh, and I think we need to. So how do we become native to place? That's the question I'm trying to answer, and I, I believe the time to answer that question is right now. So that's kind of a thought to maybe take with you over Christmas. Thank you. Any questions? Do you want to do your thing first? Or yeah, yeah. Uh, questions for Jeff? Yeah, I'll answer that. <coughs> Interesting question. Uh, so what does it mean for people who are migrating into high-rise buildings? I think those fall into two different categories in China. One, people who are moving into high-rise residential structures because they've been made to do so. That's a very large proportion. The second are people who are moving into high-rise urban structures because they bought one or they're renting one because they're part of the new Chinese middle class. The, the folks who are compelled to live in them have had their homes um, uh, torn down to make way for urban development. So both of those folks, though, come from a background that is inherently a fairly conservative background in terms of how they use resources. So there's a great deal of cultural history, at least that I've seen, of doing more with less. I don't know if that cultural attribute will survive this generation or not. It's kind of hard to say. But um, the other, I guess a more sort of hopeful thought that I would use to answer your question would be, there's a real openness that I perceive um, of people who are part of the urbanization of China. And keep in mind, this is the largest migration of humans from country to city, the largest migration of humans on the, in the history of the Earth. And the number of people moving into China uh, in the next 15 years is larger than the population of the United States, the number of people moving from country to city. 
So there's a few projects in there. Um, I would say there's, a, there's an openness to um, thinking about science and technology and what it means to daily life and for resources particularly that we don't find so much here. People here are, are pretty slow to change. I think in urban China right now, you could say particularly young people are very interested in some of the stuff I was talking about, but also particularly what it means to their <coughs> lifestyle. So I don't know what the answer is, what, how it will affect their lifestyle or their acceptance, but there's definitely an openness. It's top down. People are being told what to do. Uh, however, I don't think that's going to last. I really don't. That's my anecdotal, you know, personal opinion. Uh, technology, it's funny to be saying this at Yelp, the way people understand their own opinions relative to the group uh, has changed so much, even in the last two and a half, three years, that the political landscape of um, population feeding back to government is a fast moving thing right now. So I, I'd say stay tuned. It's going to change. That's my opinion. Yeah. It seems like you could really get kind of overwhelmed with all the permutations of, of how to build a place with all the different variables you talked about. How do you kind of, other than software, keep that in check? So as I say, uh, over analysis and paralysis, yeah. you can actually get things yeah, that's a good question. So, how do you how do you go how do you limit the the, the parameters, if you will, in order to actually get moving? Um, a couple things. One, uh, sites usually come with many of the parameters already locked down. A project, a site, political, financial considerations. Many things are locked already. So you're working with the parameters that are not. Um, and secondly, I think that. Our process, our zero emissions design process, is guided by a set of principles, or 12 principles. Uh, the top most notable ones are things like um, zero emissions on an annual basis, um, uh, zero water, net potable water use on an annual basis. When you start to, to check yourself against those principles, and they include some non-quantifiable things around um, you know, toxicity and, and quality of life and scale, when you begin to also consider those, it takes that wide level of iterations and brings it right down to a pretty manageable level. Um, I think the other answer to your question, though, is to tell the people around you, and, and this def typically happens in sort of a workshop or charrette session at the beginning. That would be community, contractor, developer, architect, engineer, the main five, that you're going to do this process very rapidly it's different than what they've done before. Expect chaos for the first few weeks and know that at the end of that point, you will have captured a massive amount of advantage as you go forward and apply more detailed tools in the future. So buy-in. Buy-in is the other answer to your question. Yeah. The, uh, the wood animation that you showed about the kind of uh, building evolving from a square rectangle to a sort of teardrop. What were, can you kind of explain what some of the yeah. parameters were telling you? Well, there, there's about four big ones that are illustrated in that animation. Um, the first is orientation. Um, and that includes not only the rotation, but minimizing of the high solar gain um, orientation. So the facade became um, rotated for optimal gain uh, based on the location. Um, the, the, that's a very hot and humid environment with a lot of... Uh, indirect uh, uh, solar gain because of the uh, moisture in the air. And then secondly, reduction of the east-west facades into that longer, um, longer profile. And then the bending of that to further expand on the north and reduce the south. And then lastly, the tapering. Um, the tapering is programmatic. So the, 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 when the office building then changes to a hotel, there's a shrinking that happens. So the last one's not a performance-driven one as much as a programmatic-driven parameter. Yeah, right here. The, uh, the graphic you showed that was the bar graph comparing the, the three highly accurate uh, ideas compared to the one that Joe had mentioned. Um, do, do you see a future in places like San Francisco where it's 
impressively difficult to install a bike rack without environmental impact for you. Do you, do you think that there is a way to take that sort of approach and apply it to places where I mean, our transit system is developed and where kids are missing their bikes? How, how do you see that playing out in areas that are geographically locked like where we are now? Yeah, that's a good question. So I, I, I was showing you the easy part, which is <coughs> places that haven't been built yet, right? <laughs> That's the easy part. The hard part is what you're talking about. Um, the, uh, well, well, locally, there's, it's some interesting stuff going on. There is legislation in Sacramento right now to um, get the level of EIR scrutiny out of what is ostensibly sustainable development patterns. I, I don't know where that's going to go. Unfortunately, what we don't have here in the Bay Area is regional planning. We really don't. We like to pretend that we do, but compared to Portland, we don't have squat. So um, I think it's a decision-making process issue, and it, I, I don't know the answer. It is painful because you can come up with a fantastic idea, including buy-in from all the stakeholders locally, and it won't actually fit into the political machine necessary to spit out a permit on the other end. If, People uh, are trying. Oh, sorry. Uh, probably time for one more. So. Okay, uh, right here up front. So, I have a question a bit more about the sense of place in some of these big things to be developer driven communities and you know, projects and trends. Um, are they are they single developers or do they break out the, the land into smaller ones? And, and how do you see uh, these places actually ending up as a good sense of havoc? Do they have a good sense of place once they are created? Well, is that a, a single developer or multi developer yeah. uh, situation to help or hinder that? So, um, first part of your question usually multiple developers because the parcels are really big. The, the decision making of who gets which parcel for how much is um, typically done at the municipal level or at the party secretary level, which is sort of like a county. Uh, we interact at both those levels with, with people in, in China. Um, the, uh, the ability, the, you know, sort of how does that drive towards a, you know, a better scale? Um, it can. We're working on a project right now um, in the Chenggong New District of Kunming in Yunnan Province that is um, uh, really great. I mean, they've got a plan, a layout for a whole new chunk of the city that is not based on Chinese super block scale. So for us as architects coming in to do an urban design, say for you know, several thousand square meters or a few hectares of, of, of development, all of the things I've been just talking about are kind of, at least from a basic scale standpoint, already built in. So that didn't happen five years ago, it's happening now. The guy who, who, who um, did that master plan is actually based here in the Bay Area. So, Foreign expertise you know, is coming into play. There, what I've also learned is that there is a planning, a, a city planning um, framework in China that, that's central government generated from the 80s that's at the source of a lot of this overscale stuff. I think they're finally realizing, hey, maybe we ought to revisit that. Um, but it, it doesn't get, there's no one who's empowered to revisit it locally. It has to be done in Beijing. So they have their own political, you know, speed bumps they gotta figure out over there. But it, it is happening, and, and, and cities can hire alter people to come in and do alternative development plans. It, it is possible, it is happening. It is not the rule, is by far the exception at this point. So I'm hopeful, but it's hard to say where that's gonna go. Yeah. Thank you. Great, thank you.